tonight is our first night into the Minor Prophets. And uh, so, uh, we have arrived at the final stage of our understanding of the Old Testament. However, even though we're in our final stage, does not mean that we have uh, come to the end. Because uh, there's lots of things still to do with the Minor Prophets. Because as you know, in your Old Testament there are several Minor Prophets. And we're going to start with the first of the Minor Prophets tonight, and that is Hosea. So, trust that uh, this will help you along as you continue to understand the, the concepts and the principles that we find in the Old Testament, not just for the time in which Hosea was ministering, but also for the time in which we minister together as the body of Christ. So, by way of introduction, we would say this about Hosea. He was the last writing prophet to minister to Israel. Now, we remember the divided kingdom, right? We know that the two southern tribes to the south were Judah, the ten northern tribes to the north were Israel, right? So here is the minor prophet that was ministering to Israel, Hosea. And uh, he was the last one to minister to them before they fell to the Assyrians in 722. With the major prophets, we've been talking a bit about uh, the Babylonian captivity because they were the prophets that were ministering to the people of Judah. Hosea was the one that was ministering, or one of the ones, he wasn't the only one, but one of the ones that was ministering to the ten northern tribes of Israel just before they fell to Assyria in 722. And uh, he has been called the prophet of Israel's zero hour. Why? Because the nation had sunk to a point of such corruption that a major stroke of divine judgment could no longer be staved off. If we remember the major prophets, who was the major prophet that was on board when it was too late for Judah. It was Jeremiah. Remember the weeping prophet. Hosea is Jeremiah's, could we say, counterpart. Okay? And the fact that his ministry was during the time when there was a point of no return for the, uh, for the nation of Israel. Uh, God's judgment was coming regardless of their response to Hosea's ministry. Although, <laughs> as with all of the prophets, right, uh, nobody really responded well. To their ministries, and Hosea was no exception. But even though judgment is the main subject of Hosea's message, what the book is remembered for most is its vivid pictures of God's love and grace. How Hosea will do this is through his wife. His wife, that for many, as you read it, and perhaps if you've ever read it for the first time, you are surprised at what God calls the prophet Hosea to do where he calls Hosea to marry a prostitute, okay? And, uh, of course, that is against all the thoughts and the principles of living a godly life, against all the principles of, of what the Old Testament law talked about. But what God was doing through Hosea and his marriage to his wife was giving a demonstration of what it was like between God and the nation of Israel. And so it was not just what the <laughs> prophet uh, said, but it was also what the prophet would do that was a demonstration to the nation of Israel of what the nation of Israel was doing to their God. And it was a very vivid picture, not just of their rebellion, but also of God's love and grace uh, for them. We'll get into a little bit of that as we go on. But let's first talk about how we would outline Hosea. Fourteen chapters. Just a small little book, and we'll find this as we go throughout the rest of the minor prophets. They won't be big books. In fact, uh, a couple of the prophets uh, will only be one chapter. For example, Obadiah is just uh, the entire book is just one chapter, and so uh, these will be now small books that we'll, that we'll deal with. So we're going to take the first three chapters of Hosea's book and talk about the adulterous wife and the faithful husband. All right. And this will be an example, this will be the lessons that will be drawn out as we go into the rest of the book, because chapters 4 through 14 talks about, and I've, I've, I've put, made it the same as the, as the top, uh, just for uh, memory's sake, we're talking about the adulterous Israel now, who represents the adulterous <laughs> wife, and faithful Lord, which represents, uh, or the faithful husband represents the faithful Lord. And so... Uh, first three chapters sets up what God is going to do through the prophet Hosea, and then the next chapters, Hosea, 
through his marriage to this uh, adulterous wife, demonstrates to the nation of Israel what they are like in God's sight. And not only what they are like in God's sight, but how God responds to them or seeks to respond to them. Even though they are adulterous in nature, God continues to be faithful. So let's find out a little bit about Hosea first before we get into the book itself with regard to the man Hosea. His name means salvation, okay? We might be finding a little bit of a pattern here now as we continue in our journey through the Old Testament because uh, Hosea, or Hoshea, okay, as we would say it in, uh, in the uh, Hebrew, uh, this is a root for names like Joshua or Jesus. Uh, the name Joshua, the name Jesus, when we translate that back into its English, is the same as Hosea, means salvation. And so this is where Hosea's name is derived from, the same Hebrew root uh, as we would find in Joshua and Jesus. As far as his family and home are concerned, his father's name was Biri. We find that in uh, verse 1 of the first chapter. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Biri. In the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. And so what Hosea does is give us a little bit of a timeline, uh, per se, as to when his ministry was. That's why he mentions the kings. Not just in Israel, but he also talks about the kings that were ministering in uh, Judah as well. And uh, because Hosea was one, as you read his work, he used many illustrations of agricultural settings when he wrote. Okay, so uh, for example, uh, Daryl Karen might be uh, interested in that because of his agricultural involvement, right? And uh, Daryl's worked long enough in agricultural development now that he probably talks like a farmer, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, this is Hosea. He talked like a farmer. He wrote like a farmer. And so that suggests that the prophet probably lived close to the soil in his young life. Okay, and we see several examples of that as we go through the book. Uh, his home, we're not quite sure where it was. It may have been in the town of Ephraim, which was a section of, of uh, the nation of Israel, or it might have been in the area of Manasseh. We're, we're only speculating now, but if we, uh, if we go to the map, uh, Ephraim was down in this area, Manasseh was up in this area, and that's about as close as we can come to knowing where uh, Hosea uh, grew up and where he, uh, where he came from. As far as his ministry, uh, he probably had no formal training in the school of the prophets, okay? So he wasn't like some of the other prophets that we find in the Old Testament that were trained in their craft. Uh, Hosea was one of those ones that was a, uh, what we might call today a freelancer, right? And uh, so he had no formal training in the school of the prophets. But his writings do show him to be a very knowledgeable man. He was, uh, he was no slouch, uh, uh, even though maybe he used agricultural uh, uh, illustrations, and sometimes, especially in our culture now, uh, when people are of the farming nature, we sometimes, erroneously so, but sometimes we think of them maybe as a little backward, when in actual fact, they're not at all. Uh, Hosea wasn't backward either, uh, even though he had no formal training. And the messages that are recorded in the book of Hosea were given to him probably somewhere between 754 and 714. Now, do we remember when was Israel taken into captivity? 7 what? 722. Okay. So, take a look at the years in which Hosea ministered. Okay. The captivity of Israel... <clears throat> kind of smack dab in the middle of Hosea's ministry as he had the messages that he had. And during his ministry, seven kings reigned over Israel. Okay, so and no, no law reigns in, those, uh, in, in that perspective. And uh, four kings reigned in Judas, on Judah's excuse me, throne during the time of Hosea's reign. And again, verse 1 of chapter 1 we kind of get an idea as to which of those kings were on the throne during his ministry. In a sense, Hosea was the successor 
to the prophet Amos. Now, the reason why we say a sense is because uh, uh, they weren't uh, contemporaries or weren't close in their ministries, but uh, Hosea kind of comes along after Amos' ministry. Uh, again, Hosea was the only writing prophet of Israel to Israel, if you understand what I'm talking about there. Amos was ministering to Judah, right? Hosea was ministering to, <coughs> to uh, Israel. And so he was ministering, as we said, during the time that the Assyrian invaders conquered Israel. Again, that was back in 722. And uh, again, that reminds us who was the ministering prophet during the captivity of Judah. Again, that was Jeremiah, right? In the Babylonian when the Babylonian captivity began in 586. And so with Jeremiah being the prophet uh, before and after the captivity of Judah, with, with Hosea being the prophet of Israel before and after the captivity of Israel, the commonality between the two prophets is this, the fact that both Jeremiah and Hosea preached the same kind of message. In fact, we could say not only was Jeremiah a weeping prophet, but we could also say the same thing about Hosea. Okay? that he was a weeping prophet as well. Why? Because he, as Jeremiah did, he witnessed the fulfillment of God's judgment against the people of Israel. Okay? That's why he was a weeping prophet. He witnessed the fulfillment of God's judgment against the people of Israel. We would say, with, with, with this in mind as well, we call Hosea as one of the tenderest of the prophets in his contact with, with Israel. Uh, remember, Jeremiah was a tender prophet as well. So Hosea was one, one of the tenderest of the prophets. And uh, his divine commission was to plead with the people of Israel to return to God. That was his message. He said, you need to repent, which means what? It means change of mind, change of heart, right, toward God. Uh, so Hosea talks about the fact that they need to return to God. But uh, what do we know about it? They did not respond. They did not respond to his message, and so the captivity came. Second Kings chapter 17 is that passage that tells us about the experience of the captivity of Israel. Okay, so if you want to see that again and be reminded of that again, you can go to Second Kings chapter 17. So that's basically what we know about Hosea. A tender prophet, one that would understand Jeremiah immensely, so would Jeremiah have understood Hosea, and the type of ministries that they had as they wept for the people of God. As far as the, the book of Hosea is concerned, with regard to a date uh, of writing, again, the messages that he had uh, were delivered sometime between 754 and 714, and uh, probably toward the end of that period was when Hosea compiled his messages together. Okay, so more around the, the uh, toward the end of 714 BC in that area would be probably when he wrote uh, his his book. As far as the setting is concerned, again in the days of Hosea, the northern kingdom of Israel was politically plagued by three major things: anarchy, <laughs> unrest, and confusion. All right, nobody was happy. <laughs> Everybody was unhappy. Uh, corruption was rampant. Um, it was a, uh, an, an, an unhealthy time in the northern kingdom of Israel. That's one of the reasons why such quick succession of the kings. Okay, remember, seven kings during the time of Hosea's ministry. So these kings didn't last long, and uh, that gives you an idea as to what was happening politically in the northern kingdom during that time. Again, Second Kings would share a lot with you as well. But what was interesting that even though there was anarchy, unrest, and confusion, this was also economically a time when the nation of Israel was very prosperous. Now, why do I find that interesting? Well, just simply because of this. Uh, these kinds of things, anarchy, unrest, and confusion, do not guarantee an economic downturn. 
In fact, it would be interesting to see how many times in world history we've had nations that have been perhaps at the peak of their economic prosperity, but as far as their morals are concerned and as far as the direction and the, all the rest of that, how much corruption and how much anarchy and unrest is taking place. Are we talking about today? Well, there's a similarity, right? Mm -hmm. We are, as far as a North American nation, right? We are the most prosperous in the world. But yet, we find that there's a lot of people that are unhappy. There's a lot of people <laughs> uh, rising up and making their voice heard, right? Some are doing it civilly, some are not doing it so civilly, right? Uh, confusion, a lot of balance, right? Uh, so uh, economically, a prosperous time for the nation of Israel, but as far as uh, politically, uh, it was a nation uh, in unrest. Of course, spiritually, uh, it was the darkest hour of the nation, okay? This is just before they're taken into captivity, idolatry, immorality, the haughty rejection of God's love, spelled disaster for this nation. Well, this is one of the reasons why God had Hosea to be trusted, because what would she do? She would stay with him for a while, but then she would go out and find other lovers, okay? And so the natural thing to do would be what? Well, since she's gone out to find other lovers, leave her on her own, don't do anything to, to rescue her, don't do anything to try and bring her back, just leave her be to her own devices. But God says, no, 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 no. You're going to go back, you're going to find her, you're going to bring her back, right? Well, how many times did God do that with his people? Okay? Uh, and they continued to reject him. That was the point that God was making through the prophet Isaiah. So, yeah, idolatry, morality, uh, the rejection of, of, of God's love, spell disaster for, for them. In fact, the, the word that, that God uses through Hosea is this word backslid, backslidden. Israel was a backslidden people when uh, Hosea preached them. And we find where he uses that in the last, in the last chapter of, of Hosea. We're in Hosea chapter uh, 14. And uh, notice what God promises through the prophet Hosea. In, uh, in his final message, uh, chapter 14, verse 4, I will heal, heal their backsliding, I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from him. Hmm. Faithful God, to an adulterous nation, yeah. I will love them freely, even though <laughs> they are a, a backslidden people. And so that with this with this setting, then we understand the theme that Hosea holds as he does his ministry. Basically, what Hosea was saying was this: the tender, loving God offers one last chance, one last chance of restoration, the restoration of just Israel. No, the restoration of a hard-hearted, adulterous Israel. See, that was the. That was the difference. God was pleading with a hard-hearted, adulterous nation, just the same way that Hosea would, would, would be pleading several times with his hard-hearted, adulterous wife. This was Hosea's plea to the nation. One last chance for this tender, loving God to, to uh, bring restoration. And, and uh, so Israel is the unfaithful wife who had deserted her husband and gone after other lovers, just as Hosea's wife did. And what God does through the prophet Hosea is he invites her back. That's the nation Israel. He invites her back. Notice again what uh, God says, what Hosea says, uh, and the words that God gives him in verse 1 of chapter 14. O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Right? There's that plea. Return, please. Return. Now, of course, we know that they, uh, that they wouldn't. But that didn't stop the prophet Hosea from inviting the people of God back to God. That's why some have spent on this. We could call Hosea the prophet of love in the Old Testament. Right? Because Hosea always responded even to the rejection of, of the uh, people of Israel, he responded with tenderness. He responded with love. 
just the same way as he kept doing for his wife when she left and he would plead for her to come back and it was always that tenderness that Jose expressed to his wife that would be the same expression that God would have for the people of Israel. And just like Hosea's wife did, she wouldn't return. Okay? Eventually she uh, had nothing to Israel, the people of Israel would have done the same. Now, when you take a look at Hosea's language and style that he uses in his, in his book, we find his style to be abrupt. Uh, it's short. Uh, at times it's, it's sharp. Okay? But the prevailing tone, even in the midst of this abruptness, the, the, the prevailing tone that he continues to exhibit is, uh, is, is something that is characteristic of him. In fact, uh, in, this, in this book that he writes, there is a lot of, again, because it's a prophetic book, lots of symbols and metaphors used, right? But what's interesting about Hosea's book is that the symbols and metaphors that he has throughout this book the prominent one that he uses, again, is that of marriage, okay? How marriage demonstrates the status of the relationship between God and Israel. The status of Hosea and Gomer's relationship, that was uh, Hosea's wife's name, Gomer, the, 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 uh, the status of their relationship was a representation of the of their relationship between God and Israel, okay? So Hosea, basically, and, and the Apostle Paul picks up on this by the time we get to Ephesians chapter 5, Hosea is the one that, that, that uh, brings to the forefront the importance not only of marriage, but the importance of the example of marriage and what marriage demonstrates, not just between a husband and a wife, but what marriage demonstrates between God and his people. Okay, and uh, so we find that that's uh, something that Hosea brings up. Uh, Paul will remind us of it in Ephesians chapter five, when God instituted marriage in Genesis chapter two. <laughs> it, the, the marriage between Adam and Eve was meant to be an example of what it is to have a relationship with God, and so uh, Hosea is one that reminds us of the, of the importance of that relationship. In fact, as we as we get into, again, the, the final question that we have for each of those books, right? And Hosea is no exception. We see where marriage and our example in it is a powerful, powerful tool. Hosea reminds us of that. Paul reiterates that in Ephesians chapter 5. That's one of the reasons why when I do premarital counseling with couples who want to get married, the very first passage that we go to, in the very first session that we have together in the premarital counseling is I take them through Ephesians 5, 21 through 33. Because as Paul talks about marriage in that chapter, and he talks about the role of the wife, and he talks about the role of the husband, as you go through that passage, it seems that Paul was talking simply about how a marriage is to work. But when you get to the end of that passage, he says, this is a great mystery. What's mysterious about it? This is how a marriage is supposed to work. And Paul says, no, 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 I'm not talking about marriage between husband and wife now. I'm talking about the marriage between Christ and his church. How the earthly marriage is to be a representation of the relationship between Christ and his church. Who is Christ? The bridegroom. Who is the church? The bride. And when Paul talks about the role of the wife, he talks about the church. When he talks about the role of the husband, he talks about Jesus and what he does. The husband is to represent the characteristics of Jesus. The wife is to represent the characteristics of the church as the bride and Christ come together, as the church and Christ come together. How our marriage relationships are lived out on this earth can either be a great demonstration of what the relationship is between God and his people or a terrible representation, right? 
That's why marriage is, is, is important. And, and marriage is to be an example. It is to be and is designed to be a powerful tool. Why did God institute marriage in the first place? Just so that we didn't need to be, didn't have to be alone? That wasn't the prime reason. The reason why God instituted marriage was so that we could be representatives of what the relationship should be like between God and his people. And when we fail in that area, then we fail at representing God properly. That's why in our day and age we're so confused about marriage. And we look at marriage from, from such a, a different perspective anymore because we've lost the importance of the example. And so, Hosea is one that reminds us of that. We don't need to go to, to, we don't need to, go to Ephesians, but it's good. Hosea does that for us already in his book. Another thing that we recognize as well, uh, uh, when we come to the book of Hosea, is that, you know what? Even backsliders have the opportunity for restoration. Right? Sometimes I think we give up too easily on people. And they make choices and they go down paths that they ought not go down. And sometimes they go down those paths a lot further than we would like them to, or we think perhaps they've even gone beyond the point of no return. That does not mean that they do, do not have an opportunity for restoration. Hosea reminds us. Even in the final hour, even in the final hour, what is God continuing to do with his people? He's pleading for them to return. Pleading for them to return. Pleading for them to return. Again, they don't until after the captivity. And after the captivity, it's only a remnant that will return. But God continues to give that opportunity for restoration even for those who we would call <laughs> backsliders. Give it whatever name you want, right? We're talking about people that are deciding to live life on their own terms rather than being submissive to the authority of God in their lives. Even backsliders have the opportunity for restoration. Something else from Hosea for us. Remember that the pleasures and the allurements of the world are temporary. Uh, notice what is written in chapter 2. And we're looking now at verse 7, just the first part of verse 7. She will chase her lovers. She, of course, is referring to, to Hosea's wife, which represents Israel. She will chase her lovers, but not overtake them. Yes, she will see them, but not find them. It'll be fun for a while, but it will lose its allurement. It'll be pleasurable for a while, but it won't stay that way. Just as this adulterous wife will chase after her lovers, uh, she will find after a while that she's not getting any response anymore, right? The, the fun party time is gone, <laughs> and back to the realities of, of life. Same with the pleasures and the allurements of the world. They look good, don't they, from the very beginning. In fact, they can be quite exciting. They can be quite uh, uh, energizing, right? Only to find that after a while, as with anything, the novelty wears off. And now the pleasure and the allurement does not have the same pull as it once did. In fact, we even get to the point where we'd rather be repulsed by it than embrace it, right? The pleasures and allurements of the world are temporary, and that's one of the things that we need to remember. Hosea helps us with that. This is something else, too, that I think is important for us to understand. Ingratitude is a cause as well as a symptom of backsliding. Notice verse 8 of chapter 2. Again, talking about Hosea's wife, representing Israel. For she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine, and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. 
prophet, the, 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 not the prophet, but, but the uh, idol that, uh, that they worshipped, right? Notice again what I said. It. She did not know that I gave her grand new wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold. Just as Hosea's wife took him for granted, right? No gratitude for what he was doing for her. That was the attitude of the nation of Israel. What God had done for them. Remember, an economically prosperous time. All that God was doing for them, helping them with, they did not acknowledge that. They did not see it as, as something that God was doing for them, but rather saw it as something that they were doing for themselves. Can I say something? Yeah. In my life, I have experienced that. It, the, the worst times I've had in my life have been in economic and prosperous times. Mm -hmm. and it's, the most challenges. Yeah, the most challenges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we see how ingratitude can get us caught in that trap, right? Where, where when we begin to take things for granted, especially when we begin to take our relationship with God for granted, what happens is we often find ourselves digressing in our relationship rather than progressing. We need to be, as we're reminded often in the New Testament, and Hosea implies that for us, we need to be a thankful people. Thankful for what God does. And not be so quick to take the credit for ourselves, but rather, perhaps be more quick to give the credit to God for what He is doing, and what He is permitting, and what He is allowing, right? Because bottom line basically is this. God's love for his people is amazing. Uh, again, uh, notice the first <laughs> verse of chapter 3. Then the Lord said to me, this is Hosea now, then the Lord said to me, go again. Love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel who took to other gods and loved the raisin cakes of the pagans. Hosea, you are going to be my example to this people as to the type of love that I have for them. Because as the community was watching what, what, what Hosea was doing, the community was going, I don't get this. This doesn't make any sense. Why on earth would you marry and go after a woman who is unfaithful and you know is going to be unfaithful? Why do you do this? Because it's a demonstration of what God has done for you. <laughs> Why does God love you? It's amazing that, that we can't see that. Right. We take it for granted. Right. But why does God love us? Even though we know. I mean, God doesn't doesn't need to tell us this, although he does, but we know. What do we do? Even when God loves us as he loves us, what do we do? <laughs> we go find other things to love. Right? Rather than loving God, we go find other things to love. And we become just as unfaithful as Hosea's wife. And the community is going, Hosea, don't you get it? Wake up! And he's saying, that's my point exactly. Don't you get it? Wake up. The love that God has for you goes beyond your responses, or should we better say, goes beyond your lack of response. That's how amazing His love is. A great reminder for us. God does not love us because of what we do for Him. God loves us in spite of ourselves. That's how amazing that love is. And Hosea reminds us of that. So, <laughs> we're reminded once again, as we have as we've been going throughout these books, right? Even though there are books that are written in an ancient time, a time so ancient that we can't really fully comprehend all that was taking place during that time. What we see nestled in the verses and in the chapters is those things that remind us again about God's love for us.
why would we want to respond in any other way than to love him back? That's what the people of Israel were getting. <laughs> maybe, just maybe, we might get it and love him back. Why? Well, as we're reminded in the New Testament, we love him because what? He first loved us. Let's pray. Thanks again, Father, for your love. Thank you for uh, Hosea and his demonstration, not just to an ancient people, but that demonstration that took place so long ago still reverberates in the, in the, in the souls of your people even today. Where, Father, we have been the same, where we have taken you for granted, and then wondered why we find ourselves in the situations and circumstances we find ourselves in. Father, forgive us for our neglect. Forgive us for our spiritual adultery. Forgive us for the times that we've taken your love for granted. And it causes us again, afresh, as your people, to return to you, to love you, and to bask in that relationship that we have because of your faithfulness to us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.